Oh, okay, we're on. Okay, we're talking to Honey Voschel. Is that pronunciation right? That's it, you got it. Okay. Honey uh, used to be part of uh, Delaware's first rock and roll band. True. Yeah. When did you guys, well, first of all, uh, you the, the, the three of you are still around? Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, yep. and they were Morty Marker. Morty Marker. Uh, he played uh, lead guitar. Jimmy Staten, who was the lead singer, played that's, rhythm that's guitar, cool. and you mm -hmm. did the drums. You guys didn't have a bass player? No bass player. Okay. No, nope, we started out no bass player. Okay. So uh, we got together uh, in school, you know, I was like 14. Jimmy was in my class at school, mm -hmm. so we graduated same year. And uh, Morty, he lived in Harrington, and uh, Jimmy's now in Kentucky, where right. he lives, mm -hmm. with his grandkids. Morty is, uh, well, he's uh, lived in, in California for the past 30-some uh, years. Right. So, uh, and I'm still here. <laughs> okay. And you all recorded on Blue Hen Records down in Harrington. That's correct. How'd uh -huh. that uh, come about? Well, I'm not really sure. I think Morty uh, set that up through a fella down there. Uh, his name slips me right now, but he's uh, at a grocery store down mm -hmm. there. And he heard the band, and uh, we used to do a lot of um, teenage dances and right. things like this, teenage nightclubs back then they right. had. And uh, he made contact with Morty, and somehow he got together, I guess, with Jimmy, and they set it up. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, I think the first recording was made at WBOC mm -hmm. in Salisbury. Right, and it went from there. Was that Hot Hot Mama? Yes, it was. Okay, huh? right. and that's a tune that I see on a, a, a number of rockabilly anthologies still. So it's yeah. it's getting around. Yeah, yeah it's <laughs> been around for a while. Okay, how many sides did you do for Blue Hand? Do you know? Uh, I only did the one. Okay, you're right. I only did the one. Uh, I think Morty, guitar player, I think Morty did two. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Jimmy had a couple replacements. Right. Uh, Patsy Saunders from Cesar Rodney, she took my place playing drums. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Richard Short, I think, may have been the guitar player that Jimmy got. But I don't know if they ever did any recording after that. Right, right, okay. Um, it was uh, a hit and a miss thing. We, I got my separate bands, uh, and Morty got his separate groups, you know. Right. And that's this is right after I left Jimmy. I started the Honeycombs Band, mm -hmm. and that's probably 1957 or 58. Right. And uh, Morty, he... Uh, got a group called the Impalas, mm -hmm. and uh, it was about a year after I started mine. Right. Morty went down and did some things on Backbeat or something like that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, he did one or two on there. Um, he, uh, he sent me a magazine with some write-ups that he had in there, right. and I think, again, I think it was from uh, England, somewhere in England or something. Somebody did something on those. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I'm at a loss. <laughs> um, so have you ever heard of, of some of the other labels that came out of Harrington, like uh, Del Rey, wasn't there another it, one? There was a Del Rey, yeah. Yeah. And I think that was produced by the same, by the same fella. Okay. Now, he started out with Blue Hen, then I think they went to Del Rey Records. Okay. Listening to the, uh, I have a lot of recordings that are on, on Blue Hen, and mm -hmm. the thing that I found curious is that uh, with Blue Hen Records, you can kind of hear a, a blend of the music changing throughout the 50s. Yeah. You know, uh, a lot of the early sides, or a lot, I don't, you know, I can't really date them chronologically, but a lot of sides were straight out country. Definitely. Right? And, and, and then you can hear some of what I call hillbilly bop. And then it sort of became rockabilly. 
So can you still you can still see the same sort oh, of? Oh yeah, there. yeah, definitely. Yeah, it, it was strictly country. There was uh, Mel Price and the mm -hmm. Santa Fe Rangers was the only band in this area mm -hmm. before we got together, and we started uh, as a trio thing you know, under the name of the Country Cats and. Uh, mm -hmm. We started working all the school dances and things like this and uh, became very popular and right after we got started is when uh, Elvis Presley came out and made the scene and uh, we had an idea that we would do the same thing, you know, mm -hmm. so we learned all of his songs that he put out and everywhere we went we had packed houses right. and I was, in, I was 14 years old. I, and uh, in school, you know, going to school and trying to, you know, keep up with the studies and everything, you know, which I managed to do, but it was, uh, it was rough. But uh, yeah, it it changed because uh, back then, even on the Grand Ole Opera, they wouldn't allow drums on yeah. the Grand Ole Opera mm -hmm. back then. And that uh, after Elvis and everybody, you know, started coming out with all this, and that's when they put them on the opera. But uh, yeah, it, it went from uh, the country to uh, the country swing kind of right. thing, and then it went to the uh, rockabilly mm -hmm. thing. Right, right. And that's uh, you know that's where it stayed for quite a while because even when I uh, was playing with uh, Wanda Jackson and uh, Roy Clark and Patsy Cline and some of these, Wanda was known as the Female Elvis, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, she she would shake things up. She mm -hmm. had a growly voice similar to uh, Janis Joplin, you know. Right. And she was uh, she was quite an attraction, and drew big crowds. We did a lot of USO tours and all for her, you know. Right. You told me that that Blue Hen Records really missed an opportunity. They had a, a chance to sign Patsy Cline to uh, to Blue Hen. Is that right? No, no, I don't. I don't no. recall that. No. Okay. Um, no, she was. She was already signed. She was already signed at that. Yeah, she point. was already signed. In fact, uh, we had spoken about uh, the name Billy Graves, right, from Georgetown, who recorded the Shag, which right. was went, you know, up in the top ten, and uh, Billy Graves became uh, a and R man for Capitol Records in right. Nashville, because okay. mm -hmm. he used to uh, always, you know, he'd call me. Couple times a month, come on down, come on down. You know, right. we'll set you up here. Right, right. And I often wondered where that turn would have taken me if I'd have, mm. you know, if I'd have went. Right. But uh, yeah, uh, Billy stayed at. Uh, he lived with uh, Charlie, uh, Patsy Klein's uh, husband. Okay. And Patsy, they they lived together for probably about a year when Billy was down there, scuffling, trying to mm. make the big time. You know. Right. Right. So, in fact, he was with my group. We were down at the Southland Club in uh, Pensacola, Florida, mm -hmm. when he got the phone call that Patsy's uh, plane went down. Yeah. And he was really devastated by that, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Blue Hen Records was basically, what was the distribution of Blue Hen Records like? I mean, I, I know that he's... I honestly couldn't tell you. I could not tell you what that was. Uh, basically, I th I figured it was just a local thing, you right. know, here in Canton, Sussex County, mm -hmm. you know, because I never heard of anything going out of that, you know. And we got the we got a lot of requests for you know the numbers that we did, but how many times can you play those two songs over and over? You know? Right. Right. Yeah. So, but uh, no, I don't know how big that. It, it never, it never become a huge, uh, never become a huge thing, you know. Right. Mm -hmm. It was kind of, I think, pretty much localized, you know. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the gal who replaced you on drums, what's her story? Where did she come from? Did you know her? Yes, her name was uh, Patsy Saunders. She was a great person. Uh, she went to Caesar Rodney High School mm -hmm. when, uh, after I left, that they got Patsy, and uh, she was uh, she was really a nice human being. Unfortunately, she had a kind of a tragic ending. Um, 
She committed suicide. She jumped off the Bay Bridge, and uh, that was, uh, you know, the <clears throat> that was the end of that. But uh, she did a good job. She wasn't with Jimmy, I don't think, very long. You know, Morty was with Jimmy probably the longest of, mm -hmm. you know, between me and her and him. And then finally, uh, Morty got his own group, as I said, and then he come to work for me and we toured the country through uh, uh, ABC Booking Corporation out of New York. And we traveled the country, you know, with that. We did a lot of dates, so uh, different places, everywhere from the West Coast to the East Coast and far up as uh, actually Maine, Boston, Florida, you know. So we traveled all over with that and then um, we ended up in uh, Fenwick Island. We worked there for four summers and uh, Morty and his wife, they had a new baby and uh, what something happened and uh, the baby died that year. So when we finished up the job there in about two weeks in Fenwick Island and Morty and his wife packed up uh, the other two kids and they headed for California and they've been there ever since, you know. Are you on any of the recordings that Morty made? No. Okay. No, I did not do any of Morty's recordings. Mm -hmm. I think he had... Um, One called Tear Down the House or something like yeah, that? Yeah, no. Um, I think there was a fellow, I can't think of his name now, he passed. But he was from, I think, Bridgeville or Seaford that, mm -hmm. that was on those recordings with him. Okay. Mm -hmm. So after Morty went to California, what did you do? Well, I, I hung together with the Honeycombs for a while. And Who then, else was in the Honeycombs? And then, uh, pardon? Who else was in the Honeycombs? Oh, back then there was Jimmy Rust, who was just here a couple of days ago, up from, uh, he, uh, when, when he left the band, uh, Jimmy got a job down at, uh, in uh, Texas, Austin, Texas, that's where he lives. And he become head of a prison. He had uh, 350 people under him. So he's made up pretty good down there. And there was Sonny Torbert, saxophone player that lived in Magnolia. And Sonny still lives over there. He just tunes pianos, I think, now. And uh, there was Bill Harding, was singing and playing guitar. He works now for a Price Honda up here by Dover. And um, Charlie Green, we call him Hank Green. Uh, he's been with us, he was probably with us the longest. And uh, he um, he played bass and we had three or four guys in the band who was singing. So we made out quite good for, uh, so probably the, the early, I'm, I'm saying 62, 63. Uh, and then we, we split up and I got into the big band thing, and which I worked in for uh, uh, the Glenn Miller band, uh, did some things with Benny Goodman, did some things with the Tommy Dorsey Orchestra. Of course it wasn't, it was all young kids, you know then, because they had long ago passed. And uh, so I kind of got into the jazz thing real heavy and studied in New York for years. Who did you study under? I studied under Sam Ulano, Charlie Perry, Roy Burns, um, who has a Quarian Drumheads company. He just passed uh, about a month ago. But uh, I studied under about 10 of the best teachers between Boston, Washington, New York, and Philly. So did you live there, or how did no, you no, I school? Oh, every so weekend, every weekend. Well, for six years, I missed, I think, four four weekends in six years traveling to New York, wow. taking lessons and learning about music theory and learning to play different instruments as well as the drums. And what instruments do you play? I, I do, I teach them all. I don't play them all well, but I teach them all. Mainly we do a lot of guitar. We have a lot of guitar and, of course, drums and keyboard and bass. The horns, not as much, because there's not as much, you know, call in this area for bands who have horns, you know. Okay. And so you were taking music lessons, you were playing with uh, orchestras, and how long yeah. did you do that? 
Well, we did that for about, uh, I guess, four or five years, um, working with the different bands and uh, singers like Al Martino. We did some things with Al. I think he was from Philadelphia. Yeah, he was. But, um, and uh, after that happened, we got together as a trio thing. I joined a, a jazz trio, Len Ng, Bill Porter, and we worked a place called the Seahorse Restaurant. I'm sorry, what was the name of the band? Seahorse Restaurant. No, no, the band. The Len Ng Trio. Oh, the Len Ng Trio. Yeah. And he was uh, from Ocean City. And we worked the Seahorse Restaurant in Ocean, and down in the Rehoboth for about 12 years till they closed up. And then uh, that's basically, we, we uh, did some country club things down there. And that's what led me to reorganize the Honeycombs Band. Because uh, we would go in there and play the country club and we may have 12 tables of people sitting around, you know, listening to jazz and standards and after they, you know, had their dinner and they come up and said, you guys sound great, you know. <laughs> so they left and you know, I'm sitting here wondering, well, if it was that great, you know, how come you didn't stay for the evening, you know. So one night I went upstairs, I heard this rock band playing upstairs. So I went upstairs at the country club and upstairs was all these people that was down there eating. They were upstairs dancing and having big time, you know. And... Uh, so I got to thinking, you know, I come home and I thought, well, you know, that's what, I, I love to play jazz, but there's just no market for it down here in Delaware, you know. So I'm thinking, you know, put something together that... Uh, about what year was this? This was about, uh, well, it had been 28 years ago. Okay. So we got to do the math on that. So, well, it's nice to see Yeah. Yeah. So, um, anyway... I got together and I called these people that I knew who were interested and uh, we started rehearsing at Wesley College every mm -hmm. Sunday we would rehearse and I took the um, billboard magazines and took the, the 10 top hits for each year from 1954 up till the current day and we picked out two to three songs that were in the top ten because I knew everyone was going to be familiar with these, you know, they had heard them and they were on the charts for, you know, weeks. So that's what we put together and we uh, got this thing together. It was a horn band. Uh, that was originally uh, Lynn Doughton, trombone, Dave Joyner on uh, guitar. Um, that was uh, Phil Staley. We used Phil Staley on keyboards. We used Alan Kessel. He was there on uh, vocals. And uh, bass players, uh, we started out with Hank Green, and then we ended up with uh, Jack Wright from Salisbury. So we had a variety. Um, Gary Spangler was the um, music director up at Wesley College for 32 years. And he retired. He was our trumpet player. And we got a sax player who I'd played off and on with for years uh, by the name of Buckshot Roberts. And uh, we, uh, we got this thing together and started playing out after about six months. And it kind of uh, just rolled right along. I'm sorry, and did you have a day job? Or did you have this place? This. this so yeah. this is, tell us what this is. Well, I, I do, I, I teach here, mm -hmm. and I teach, uh, fortunately this past year the students have picked back up again where they were, because I, one time I was hitting 82 students a week here. What, what's the name of this place? The Drum Pad. And where are we? Felton. Felton, Delaware. So you Felton own the Drum Delaware. Pad in Felton, Delaware. Yep. Okay, and you sell musical instruments. We sell music instruments, and we drum repair lessons. instruments, and we lessons. do a lot of lessons here. You know. Okay, I'm sorry, go back to the chron no, that's chronology. Okay. But, uh, you know, that's that's basically where we were, and uh, the thing just kind of mushroomed and mm -hmm. rolled right along, and we, uh, we ended up uh, playing probably 75 to 100 jobs a year, you know, with this band. And we went through a few different, you know, people, but... Uh, 
most of them actually have been with us uh, since we started from about well, 26 to 28 years, you know. So that worked out real well for us, and we all had a good time. And then just uh, a couple of years ago, um, Dave uh, Joyner, our guitar player, was having back problems and shoulder problems, and uh, he decided to bow out. And our singer, he decided he wanted to do uh, a karaoke type thing just as a single, you know, mainly for the money thing, because you, you know, DJs and singles make more money than you do playing in a band. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, that's about where we are. So you're, <laughs> you're still, still playing? playing. Oh, I'm still playing. Yeah, I've played this past week. I played uh, in Dover, and then uh, this past Saturday night, uh, two of my substitutes I put in the band after these guys left, mm -hmm. and they they booked the jazz thing down there, like once a month. That's all that is. It's down at uh, Adam's Rib House down in uh, Fruitland, Maryland, just below Salisbury. So I got a chance to go back and play some more jazz things and everything. Yeah. Of course, again, like I say, you know, the crowds are just not quite there, you know, in that type of environment. You know, as they are. People that come in, they want to dance and have a few cocktails or drinks, and they, you know, they stay there for the full evening. And that's not the way it is, you know, when you're playing the big band stuff or the jazz thing, you know, that's kind of a thing of the past, so to speak. Tell us the name of the most famous people that you've played with. Well, I've worked with, um, of course, Patsy Klein. I always had a big name, and uh, Roy Clark, I worked with him. Al Martino, a different type of thing. And uh, as I said before, the bigger bands, he did a couple things with uh, Lionel Hampton, uh, Benny Goodman, uh, Tommy Dorsey Orchestra, uh, Glenn Miller Band. Now these were like, uh, a lot of the people from Wilmington were also in these mm -hmm. bands, you know. They played in these bands. Marty Klein? <laughs> yes, I remember that name, yeah. And there was a sax player up there. He used to call me all the time. He was very good. Not Boise. Was it Boise? No, 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 but I, I know who you mean. Uh, Charlie Robinson, maybe? No, he, he led the band mm -hmm. and he played alto sax. You ever yeah. been on television? Pardon? You ever been on television? Yeah. Yep. When? Well, the first time I think we were in Boston and it was a ladies talk show and they had us on there. We were playing Jerome's nightclub in Boston and we got on this show. It was like every Wednesday and Saturday mornings we did these and we did a short uh, he wasn't there, but it was the Dick Clark show, a fellow by the name of Wee Willie Weber. Oh, oh yeah. I remember him. Mm -hmm. You remember? Sure. Oh, yeah, of course. The yeah. guy with feet. Uh, <laughs> he wasn't so wee. Was he? <laughs> he must have had 17 or 18 size, because yeah. that, that's all I can remember about the guy, you know, <laughs> was how big his feet was. But he was doing a thing uh, for the Dick Clark show, so we did that. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, then we, uh, well, we were on WBOC. We used to be on there down in Salisbury. And that was also, that was Wednesday um, around 4 o'clock. And we were on there Saturdays because we were playing um, down in Salisbury Saturday night. So that, I think, was around 4 or 5 o'clock also. And we did that for quite a while. And uh, down there at the place called the Northwood Bar in Salisbury. Uh, a fellow, a local fellow from Georgetown who just died a month ago. His name was, uh, they called him Bunky I. And he's, uh, <clears throat> he was, um, he did a lot of things with uh, Roy Clark and uh, also worked at Jimmy, uh, Jimmy Dean show when it was in Washington. Because Billy Graves was on that That's also right. with mm -hmm. a fellow with the name of uh, Dick Flood, they were the mm -hmm. country lads, and they did the Jimmy Dean show over there for years. So... Did you ever do any studio work? Were you on any albums? Yeah, I did do studio work. Anybody we would recognize? Mm, probably not, no. Okay. There wasn't anybody that... Uh, but uh, And we did some local stuff too, but... How about... Mainly the studio stuff uh, 
The last one I did was with my son's band, <laughs> uh, a band called Love Seed Mama Jump. Oh yeah, we know that band. And we went to New York, and he said, "Let's do some percussion with me," because you know, he plays drums. Yeah. So uh, I did that. But before that, we did uh, a big recording studio in Philadelphia. Uh, Virtue. Uh, Sigma Sound. Sigma, yeah. Okay. That sounds familiar. Yeah, Sigma Sounds big. Yeah. How about famous venues, where you, you know, places that you played? Uh, that we played? Yeah, biggest venue you ever played. Well, I'll tell you one of the most embarrassing ones. <laughs> We'd love to get that on video. Well, this, this is a true story. And uh, we were out at the Trianon Ballroom in Oklahoma City. It was a um, Nashville-type show. They had uh, the Wilburn Brothers, uh, Roy Acuff was on there, Patsy, um, Wanda. In fact, I was working with Wanda Jackson at the time. And I think they had two to 3,000 people in that place that night. And we were right in the middle of the song, and we were playing, you know, <laughs> and my drum seat breaks. <laughs> so I do this backwards, you know, <laughs> backwards on the stage, you know. Well, if you've ever heard two or three thousand people laugh at one time, you know, it's pretty loud. Yeah. So I finished the set standing up playing drums, you know. That was the most embarrassing thing. How about the high point of your career? Oh, I don't know. It would have probably been playing with um, some of the local big bands. or uh, We did uh, a couple of things with, um, like I say, El Martino. And I enjoyed that kind of music, you know. Uh, of course, he was in The Godfather, you know, that's the last time I had seen him, you know. But uh, I, I don't know, we, uh, we, we backed up a lot of groups going back as far as, uh, we worked the same venues as Liberace, and we backed up for two or three weeks. The Ink Spots, when they were big down in uh, Florida, and uh, we, did, we did a lot of shows like that. We did shows with... Uh, Roy Clark, uh, you know, and people like this. That were a lot of fun, you know. So you taught music lessons, famous students we might know? Uh, yes, as a matter of, well, and I don't know as you'll know. Uh, my very first drum student was my newspaper boy from years back. His name was Billy Dignitz, and he lived a couple miles down the road. Well, he, uh, he, uh, was my student for about four and a half to five years and um, he went to Atlanta and he played with all kinds of people. Everybody from Chet Atkins to the bands that I just mentioned, the ones that I worked with. He worked with uh, uh, Carol, what was her name? Um, Carol King? No. no, not Carol King. Um, I, I have it, I got it in a book out here. Uh, he sent me a book for my birthday, and he had all these people that he had worked with, you know. But uh, he, uh, just before he passed away, he uh, come up and uh, we sat down and talked for a while, and he, uh, he brought some pictures with him. He said, you know this drummer? And I said, yeah, it's Dan Plasma. He plays with a group called Imagine Dragons. And they're still big. They started out three or four years ago. And uh, Don was from, uh, Dan rather, was from um, Atlanta. And he studied from Billy. Billy taught him. And uh, of course, Billy was a good player. You know, he was, he turned out to be a real good player. And he played, uh, he worked, I think, five and a half years with uh, Chad Atkins. He worked with Barnum and Bailey's uh, the Ringling Brother Circus. He said that job was the hardest. He said it almost killed him. He said it was, you know, it was so challenging and he had to play so loud. And he worked with that, I think, for about four years. But uh, he uh, he taught um, uh, Dan to play. And uh, the band is still one of the top groups today. Mm -hmm. um, I, I taught a bass player. I can't even remember his name now. It's been... But he, he uh, played, uh, he was from Magnolia, actually. 
he played bass for the Dan Matthews Band. Dave Matthews Band? Dave, what did I say, Dan? I'm thinking. Dave Matthews Band. Dan, Dan he Dan played Matthews. bass Matthews, uh, right. yes. for him for a while. Yeah. But uh, I don't know. You know, it just goes on and right. on. Right. We backed up uh, a lot of the early uh, people like Bobby Rydell. Mm -hmm. and, really? Uh, and we worked a couple of weeks with uh, uh, a guy who had uh, Dave Baby Cortez, Cortez was his name. Do you know what the song right. it, The uh, Happy Wonder. Uh, yeah, right. No, was it The Happy, happy Organ? Organ happy it. Organ. <laughs> well, that was close. <laughs> okay. Did you have a manager, management company? Uh, no, we just had a booking agent. Uh, Who was your booking agent? Yeah, well, the longest one we had was Jolly Joyce Theatrical Agencies out of New York and Philly. And uh, the one that did us, uh, did us the most good as far as promoting and money and getting us booked six to eight months ahead was ABC Booking Corporation, and that was out of New York. But uh, that was the second biggest agency up there under William Morris. How did you get hooked up with them? Oh, um, somebody who worked in the Jolly Joyce agency had told me that we should, you know, put our name in or go up and see these guys about this. But when you when you go in there, it was really, it, it's kind of this huge building, and you got all these little spaces. This space over here takes care of the girl singers. This one takes care of the guy singers. This one takes care of the duos. This one takes care of the trios. And it was just, you know, if they had somebody scheduled to book each type of act that they had, you know. So as far as making connections in that, I'm not even sure. I know we have some eight or ten pictures out there with ABC Booking Corporation on them. How but has I, the industry changed? Uh, well, <clears throat> I don't watch the Grammy Awards anymore, <laughs> uh, and I won't get into all this, but it's it's changed a lot, um, as, as it always did. I always said I would keep up. I used to play in Bob Wagner's orchestra for about four years, and uh, it was a big band, and they had the Glenn Miller charts and the Tommy Dorsey bands, uh, In the Mood, you know, that type of music, and I thought they kind of, uh, I, I really enjoyed my stay with them, but I thought it was, uh, they really didn't keep up with what was going on. You know, it passed 70s and 80s, and finally they disbanded. And I, talking to myself, I said, well, I want to keep up with what's going on in the music business, you know. So I listen, I keep listening to things. And I, I'm not hearing a lot of things I, you know, to me, wasting my time listening at, you know. Um, the drummers, uh, a lot of them, there's some great ones out there, but some of them are house builders, you know. They want to uh, just play as loud as they can, you know, of course they which again is okay, but it's a different style of music today. And, uh, and the band my son plays in, they do a lot of cover work. And they play extremely loud, you know, like most of the groups today. And um, uh, <laughs> I remember the first rock concert that I went to was in Philadelphia. It was ACDC. Mm. And my son, who plays with Love Seed, he wanted to go. He was 12 or 13. I said, okay, you know. So we went, and uh, we were up in Nosebead uh, Gallery up there, you know. But I could still feel the bass, you know, slamming me here. And we had um, about six younger people down in front, and they were having a good time with their cigarettes and things, you know. So I, I remember that, you know, because I still had a headache about two days after that, you know. But uh, even back then, you know, a lot of the bands now that I didn't appreciate, I do appreciate now. 
because I, some of the things I listen at today, I don't, you know, I don't uh, really get into them that much. I can play it, you know, I can sit down and do it on the keyboard or guitar or drums, but it's, it's uh, you know, it's for the younger generation to do, you know. So you wrote two songs? Did you write anything? Well, I wrote uh, 23 songs. Oh, 23 actually. songs. Yeah. And they were mostly with... Uh, Country cats? Mostly with a trio thing was all, you know, okay. nothing. I didn't even try to get them pressed or anything, you know. Oh. Are, is your stuff available on the internet, on YouTube? No. Nothing. Uh, well, well, yes, it probably is. is. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it would be under uh, the honeycombs.com, and it would be two bands, the one across the pond, but we're the first one up there. And uh, Dave Joyner, he put all of our stuff on there. He's the one that's responsible for all the mistakes on the website. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he had uh, he he put some stuff on there well, that, be... that we did, but it's all cover stuff, you know. Oh, I see. Okay. It's all things like so. We, we, all your originals, you have recordings of them, but they're not they're nowhere. Uh, no, I have some of them up there on a CD, but they're you know they're just uh, not. Not, not what I'd want anybody to hear. Ah, you know? oh, I see. Okay. Because, you know, if we put this interview up here, it would be really nice if we had where people could click on a link and hear some of your you know, music. Well, the play. only way they could do that would probably get it off our website. Okay, so your website. Really, so a yeah. link to that, and then they could hear yeah. what you want to put out yeah. there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Well, um, did you ever, you ever do a gig in Wilmington or that area? Yes, I have. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, we worked, we opened for a couple acts up there. One was the uh, Four Tops and the Temptations, mm -hmm. and that was uh, during the big boat, boat festival they used to have there. Oh, the Tall Cal Ships. The, uh, yeah, the Tall Ships. Uh -huh. And we worked there, and we also opened for uh, uh, wasn't Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Earth, Wind, and Fire? It's no, an easy one to go to. No, it's, it's just close. You're in the right, right. neighborhood. Okay. Chicago. But uh, the, the drummer, I remember the drummer in the band coming up to me afterwards and says, do you live around here? He says, I'd really like to take some lessons. <laughs> and I, I always looked up to this guy, you know, all my life. You know, he was on the cover of all the modern drummer magazines and all this. And he was, you know, Atlantic City, Steel Pier and all this. Talking but, uh, about Wilby Fletcher? No. no. Bobby Columby. Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Was that Blood, Sweat, and Tears? Okay. Then it was Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Mm -hmm. Good thing we got a musician in the house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, a lot of those guys, uh, back when they first come out, some of them I didn't care for. Uh, uh, the drummer, Steve Smith, who played with... Uh, Journey. <laughs> Steve Smith played with Journey and I never liked his playing because he he just didn't have it together, you know. And when after he left Journey, he went to study off the Jim Chapin, whose son was Harry Chapin, uh, Cats in the Cradle and all these. Yeah. And after he left Jim, he got his act together and he's a phenomenal player today. He plays really, really well. And there's several guys like this, you know. And there's uh, a lot of players that, you know, they made a big name for themselves because they were with a group that had a lot of hit records, you know. Who was one of the earliest drummers to, to get you started or interested in drumming? Oh, it would probably be Buddy Rich. Buddy Rich? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Back then and still now, he was always one of the best right. in the business. He did things with his left hand that most drummers can't do with all four limbs, you know. Was he a southpaw, do you think? No. no. He was, uh, Buddy was a real freak at the drums. Okay. He started playing drums at the age of two, oh, right. before anybody else. He was doing his own solo work at the age of four. Mm -hmm. His mom and dad were into vaudeville. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he, he got into that. And uh, he was, uh, he's quite the master of the of the drums, you know, and even today, you know, I, I watch all the drummers and keep up with everybody, but I haven't seen anybody that, you know,
could really do what he did, you know. How about in the field of rock and roll? I mean, a DJ Fontana comes to my mind. Well, yeah. DJ was right there with Elvis. Right. <laughs> yeah, and he, he did it like it should have been done, you know. Mm -hmm. So he's he has to be considered one of the one of the great drummers right. in rock and roll. Um, whenever we go on a job, um, we always get requests for something called wipeout. Mm -hmm. And the reason that is is very easy and people can sit down at the table and play it with their hands, you know. Right. But uh, there was a lot of other drum things that come out at that time. Cozy Cole, Topsy Part 1, Part 2. And who was it? Uh, um, there was another guy too that uh, <clears throat> had a couple of drum hits. But that never went over. I mean, if you didn't sing, right. chances are you weren't going to make the big time, you know. You had to sing, that was it, you know. Um, Actually, there's a fellow down here, I lived down here for a while, who claimed that he invented the drum roll for Wipeout. <laughs> <laughs> His name was Michael Tucker. Michael Tucker, no, no I've never no, heard of him. Okay. But I doubt that he invented that. Okay. <laughs> because that drum roll, unless he was a hundred and some years old, okay. that had been around for a long years. time. It was all basically in musician's terms, it was 16th notes. Okay. And it was right and left hand with a few accents. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it wasn't really uh, nothing hard to play. Right. So. <laughs> but the Safaris put it on the map, mm -hmm. basically. Yeah. Yep. I have that on one of our recordings. We, we did five or six uh, CDs that we have out. And uh, the other, uh, about uh, two weeks ago, I guess I had a student come in and he asked me, he had the sheet music to wipe out. Mm -hmm. And I said, is your band going to play that? He said, yeah. So I wrote it down for him, showed him, because it's only a two measure phrase, you know. And I says, I'll let you hear it, because he hadn't heard it, you know, right. a young kid. So I pulled our recording out, and when I played the recording, I stopped, you know, I'm thinking, wow. <laughs> I'm thinking, I'm not sure I can play that now. Because I it was played super fast. I played it about twice the tempo that the actual recording was, you know. Mainly because we wanted to get 12 songs on the CD. So we just sped a few of them up, you know. Advice for uh, somebody getting into the business today? Uh, yeah, have a good backup. Have a day keep job, your day job. Keep your day yeah. job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't quit your day job. But and I, get lessons here, right? Yes, you got to get your lessons here, yes, because yeah. I teach them all. Yeah. And, and, I, and seriously, lessons. I mean, if you want to oh, yeah. play in a band, you should. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because I, I can teach somebody. In fact, I just had a bass player. He'd been with me for about two and a half months, and now he's playing in a church band, which is what he wanted to do, yeah. But yeah, I can I can teach kids. I know all the shortcuts, where a lot of the teachers, uh, uh, nothing against any music stores or anything, but a lot of teachers are <clears throat> that play at some of these stores will come in and take two or three lessons and then go out and say, you know, I can teach, I can teach. And the kids like 19, 20 years old, and they really don't know anything about music, you know, mm -hmm. or they really don't know how to teach music, you know. Right. So it, it makes a big difference, you know. And uh, it's, uh, it's a thing you have to work with, where some teachers can show you something and if a student doesn't get it, then that's it, too bad. But I have five or six different things. If they can't get it this way, I'll show them another way to get it. And that's, you know, coming from being, you know, teaching a hundred years, you know, that's what you learn to do. How know. important is, is actually being able to read music or score? It's very important. Yeah. Uh, a lot of my students that come in, they don't want to read music. Yeah. They just want to play. So if that's what they want, that's fine. But by reading music, I can sit down, put on a CD, mm -hmm. and almost write it out as it's played. Right. What uh, the guitar player, his chord progressions are playing, mm -hmm. you know, or keyboard or the drum beats, you know. Right. And the same with uh, um, if you're watching somebody play on TV, 
I can look at them and I know exactly what they're doing, you know. So I can sit right down and do it. Now, I might not be able to do it as fast as they do it right. because they're playing licks that they've played for 25 or 30 years. So, you know, it may be a, something that I hadn't stumbled onto, but I can play it and I can pick up uh, books and if there's something in there, a certain beat somebody wants to learn, you know, I can sit and read those and apply them to the drum set and put them in the band, you know. So, yeah, I consider it a very important thing yeah. to be able to uh, read music. Yeah, one of our board members is a very good musician, and, and that's one of his complaints that there are so many musicians that are good musicians, good with their instruments, but they can't read music. Yeah. And it's, it's a real limitation. It does, it does limit you. Because yeah. half the stuff that I know, if I didn't read, mm -hmm. I probably couldn't play. Right. That's one thing I credit one of my teachers to in New York uh, after six years with him. Uh, he was the reader. Mm -hmm. And he played in a Dixieland band up there. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is one of his things. When I started with him, I didn't know what a quarter note or a whole note or anything was. When I left him after four years, I had two briefcases that I carried to New York. I had a total of 82 books, and we went through a page out of every book, at every lesson, mm -hmm. which took, I got it down to about 40 minutes that I could do that. Mm -hmm. So I, I got uh, pretty good, you know, in the reading thing, I got to where I could just, I could see the music and see what's written, and I know what it sounds like, right. you know. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing, I mean, if you're playing in a rock band or a country band today, um, it's, you know, it's these same figures mm -hmm. that's played in jazz, that's played in big bands, that's played in gospel music, rockabilly, country, whatever, you know, it's the same figures that you play over and over. Mm -hmm. And you've got to learn, you've got to learn chords, you've got to learn bar chords, you've got to learn chord progression stuff. Mm -hmm. And without reading, you know, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean much. You ever heard of a Boise Lowry's method? Who? Boise Lowry. Yes, I had a, was there a book out on that? Yes, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. I had a book come through with that right. one time, I remember. Mm -hmm. I'm not real familiar with it. Okay, but, um, yeah. Boise Lowry was a teacher in Wilmington. He taught a lot of uh, musicians from Clifford Brown to oh, okay. Matthew Shipp, yeah. you know, and everyone in between. And he had a method for uh, improvisation. Okay. And uh, there were others who sought him, sought him out, like Hugh Masekela mm -hmm. uh, was very interested yeah. in his method. But here's, here's a, I'm trying to think of a name that just passed me here while you was talking about him. Uh, bass player, graduated from uh, Berkeley School of Music. He mm -hmm. taught at the Wilmington Music School. Oh, Ernie Tim Watts. Swarbrick. Swarbrick, yeah, right, okay. He passed Tim, away a little while. Tim was a good friend of mine. After he graduated, I was still young. Uh, I went up to Wilmington Music School and I took some lessons from Tim. And finally, a couple of years after that, Tim was playing bass in my band mm -hmm. down here at uh, Hanelope in uh, right. uh, Rehoboth. And uh, he, was, he was the character. The last time I worked with him, the last time I seen him, we were at uh, playing outside in Newark, I think, at a car show, mm -hmm. and Tim come by and waved. I uh, said, "Come on up, you know." Tim come up and he put on his bass and played, you know. And uh, but he was uh, he was something you never knew what to expect from Tim, you know. Yeah. yeah my only encounter with him was he was in the business of telling selling T-shirts. T-shirts. Oh, yeah. he was big right. on those T-shirts down there at the uh, the market right. down in Newcastle. Well, he come in, uh, we were doing a New Year's Eve job one time, and uh, the fellow from Washington hired me and hired Tim. He said, told Tim, he said, now, this is a tuxedo job, it's New Year's Eve, mm -hmm. so make sure that you've got the tuxedo <laughs> So, about ten minutes of, here the door bust open, and here comes this guy walking in. He's got a Santa Claus suit on. <laughs> And it's, it's Tim, and uh, this, uh, the guy from Washington, uh, 
anyway, he, he wasn't the kind that found humor in that at all, you know. So. But he played, Tim played at night in his uh, Santa Claus suit. Other musicians from that era that are still around Delaware that we should be interviewing? Uh, you're talking about the ones I worked with? Yeah, or, or anybody that you know of that, you know? Uh, well, I mentioned most of them to you yeah. and uh, where they were working. I can't really think of anybody else. You know, I pretty well named all the guys that are still around, you okay. know. Because uh, Jack Moore, uh, he passed away last year. And uh, the guy used to be our band boy. He did Elvis invitations. He died last year. Sax player from Salisbury, Bill Short. He was with the Corvettes and uh, different bands, and he he passed away two years ago. Boy. So a lot of the guys, you know, you're losing touch with them. You know, they're not around anymore. I did work to a hotel uh, also uh, up in Wilmington. Um, Something blue. Oh, it came into town and left. It was a restaurant right. or something. Yeah, yeah. It was there for just a little while. Yeah. yeah. Blue. I worked yeah, I know there with um, a guy who <clears throat> did. Um, in fact, he went over to Atlantic City and joined Legends over there because he was. Uh, he did excellent uh, imitation things of Frank Sinatra and mm -hmm. Sammy Davis and all these guys, you know. And that's the last time I worked with him, but that was at. Uh, that hotel up in Wilmington. Mm -hmm. Aqua Blue? No, Deep no, it was Blue, Blue, Blue something. Yeah. Yeah. It was right on same. kind of the main drive. Right, right on downtown. Delaware Avenue. Yeah. 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 Blue. Deep Blue? No, no, no. It'll, it'll come to me after we get in the car. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right, so your next uh, your next thing you're going to be doing in the next phase of your life. The next thing I'm going to be doing is getting in the car and going down and watch my son's band play tonight at the Rusty Rudder in uh, Rehoboth. So you passed on. What is your son? Does he have a day job? Uh, yeah, he teaches. He oh. teaches school. Oh, okay. And uh, um, he's been doing that for three or four years. He lives in Swarthmore, Pennsylvania. Uh -huh. You played with him. You must be proud, huh? Oh yeah, yeah. And I sat in with him every once in a while. I just do the percussion. I let him do the drums because, all if you're not familiar with some of the arrangements where they stop, you know, and, mm -hmm. and all this, then you've got to be careful. But with a percussion thing, you can fake a lot of it, you know. Mm -hmm. So and he's and they've been together for years, you know. Brian Gore, you, you may recognize that name, Gore. Gore-Tex. Oh, well, yeah. Gore, oh, yes. Yeah. Well, that's his dad. Okay. Oh, really? So, he, uh, yeah, Brian's been there since they started back in 90 or 91. He plays guitar. He loves to play. You know. Yeah. I have that band I recognize, they've been around for well, quite a while. Well, they've been around for years, yeah. yeah. Anything you want to add? Any other questions? Well, I just have? wanted to know if, if at some event in the future uh, we asked you to play uh, what's the chances of getting Morty on this side of the country, or maybe? Well, in, uh, right now it'd be rough because he's on a boat. He's on his way to Alaska on a cruise. <laughs> well, we're thinking maybe in six months or a year or something like well, that. Well, that would be nice. Uh, Does he still could... play? Oh yeah. Yeah, there's a there's a yeah. I posted a video uh, mark marker on. Yeah, on he's, our uh, site. you wouldn't recognize him now because he looks like uh, what's the country player? It's got the beard. Willie and, Nelson. No, no close. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Morty's a, he's a great player, yeah. and he's he's schooled in jazz standards, rock. He loves country music. He likes things like Merle Haggard and all this too. You know, and the lady he just married, his wife passed away, and he got married, and uh, mm. uh, she was a singer out of Las Vegas. So they they've been doing a duo thing out there. Um, in Glen, Glendora, yeah, Glendora, California, and uh, so you know they were thinking about coming in, and then they decided this year they come in last year, so this year they decided to go uh, on a cruise up to Alaska. So he usually gets here about once every two years, you know, okay. and about he's he's a fun guy. He's an excellent guitar player. Yeah, you ought to check out the, the thing I posted on the uh, site. Yeah, very good. <laughs> and uh, Billy Graves, do you think he, he'd ever... Billy Graves, uh, 
I, he won't be up this way, Billy won't. We no. communicate all the time from, uh, you know, I get a lot of emails from Billy, mm -hmm. and uh, he uh, he's down in Lakeland, Florida, I think is where he lives. And he's married and uh, got some kids and grandkids. Billy, I think now, I believe, is 82 years old. So he didn't come up to either one of our uh, rock and roll reunion things that we put on in 2010 and 2015. So I'm sure he wouldn't be up. But I did, uh, I, I told him you guys may be calling him, you know, for some information. He can give you probably a lowdown on some of the stuff he's, he's done, you know. Good. Because he did uh, that shag that was, uh, it, it was like a one-hit wonder yeah, also. Right, yeah. But it was a hit, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And Billy worked with me in the honeycombs for quite a few years. Down in the Florida area a lot, you know. So. All right, I think we're going to wrap it up a little bit. And right. I think uh, uh, we're going to take maybe some pictures of okay. the pictures that you That's have, if fine. that would be okay. I'm going to sign you guys all up for lessons so we'll right. start a band. <laughs> all right, thanks. <laughs> See ya.